What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I had asked in the community post, and so many of you came out and said, yes, you would like to see vlogs or sort of retrospectives, thoughts about my playtest. So if you're unfamiliar or, or don't know what I'm talking about, I just started a brand new campaign this past Tuesday night. It's Greek mythology themed, and I get to be a player, and I'm playing a human thief rogue using only playtest rules from 1D&D. So I'm very excited to give this a shot. This will be the first time when I fill out one of these playtest surveys that I can actually provide actual feedback. Uh, and then my other players, to give you a little frame of reference as to the game, we're getting a couple of different avenues from this. Now, the, our, one of the players is playing a ranger and decided to change from their initial decision and go with the playtest version of the ranger, playing a Shatterkai, the updated monster from uh, updated race rather from uh, Monsters of the Multiverse, and is using the Gloom Stalker subclass. So we're trying a playtest class with a 5e race and a 5e subclass, and the other player is just playing a variant human um, battlemaster fighter. So we are getting, in that aspect, one person that's using purely 5e, one person that is using purely 1D&D playtest, and another player that is kind of using a mesh of both. So in theory, this should give us an idea of what ends up working the best or how things interact, backwards compatibility, things of that nature. Now, uh, this was the first episode of a brand new campaign in a world that needed establishing. So probably the first quarter to half of the episode was kind of just world building and setting the scene for the characters. So we didn't get too, too much time in game to test things out. But that being said, I did get to experience a handful of aspects of the playtest and I wanted to talk about it. Also, to your suggestion, I'm going to attempt going forward for these playtests, again, in more of a vlog-style video, will be conducted, if I can, immediately after the game ends on Tuesday. And in an ideal world, I'll also be able to ask the other players and the DM to chime in on this. Probably won't be more than a 20 to 30 minute video. And again, I, I can't promise that. I'm going to pitch it to them this Tuesday that, hey... People would love to see if we want to take some time after, like turn the cameras off, end the stream, start a recording, and then talk through kind of what we experienced, what our thoughts are to give actual, you know, so that other people can see th and think about what, how we're, you know, dealing with this. Uh, but again, it's it usually ends around midnight our time uh, on Tuesday, so they may not want, if they get up for work and stuff like that, they may not want to stay an extra 20 minutes to half an hour later. I'll try. Worst case scenario, if they don't go for it, I'll still film a video about my experience and what I looked at and saw at the table. So that being said, uh, I like I said, I am playing the uh, human from the 1 D&D playtest as well as the thief rogue from the 1 D&D playtest. Uh, and I got to experience a handful of the different aspects of it. So first of all, on like the base level, uh, I got to use scimitars as a rogue as opposed to short swords because of the updated rules uh that they have where the rogue just gets proficiency with finesse uh martial weapons so that was pretty cool uh i'll tell you one thing up front uh i've been pretty spoiled by D, &D beyond if i'm being honest with you and uh the fact that i can't do this because D, &D beyond doesn't have the playtest materials available in it which i can understand being a sort of a bummer on the uh, or, or like well one it's a definitely a bummer but also being kind of hard to do programming wise because you already have the rogue, which has a certain structure and coding built into it for the way the different abilities come online and stuff like that. And then basically we're like, hey, come up with something completely new. Here's a whole reworked structure. But I also feel like considering the fact that the playtest is material is only available on D&D Beyond, that you should probably assign some assets to trying to make that a reality. And even if it's like a separate sub server, I don't know what you'd have to do to make it happen. I know this is all someone with no, no real programming experience. I have some, but not like to that level. So I know it's got to be a lot more difficult than I'm making it out to be. But if we could have access to the playtest stuff in D&D Beyond, I also think you'd get a lot more people playtesting. Uh, especially if somebody has bought into the D&D Beyond ecosystem, they've been using it for years and years and years. And you say, hey, play test this, and they have to go back to paper. There are probably people out there who have only played D&D &D with D&D &D Beyond. They've never even done the paper character sheets. That'll seem like blasphemy to some of you, but it is what it is. 
So I have to go back to using pen and paper, which is fine. That's how I did it for years and years and years, so I'm not worried about it. But I did enjoy having to easily track things in D&D Beyond. The other side of that is when we're streaming, a lot of people like to be able to see the character sheets. And I can usually put a link to the associated character sheet in the video description or have it pop up as a timer during the live stream. People can't see that. They can see one of the characters who's playing the, you know, the Battlemaster fighter because his is perfectly replicated there. Whereas the other two characters, it's, we can have character sheets, but they're not 100%. They, they don't match up. I don't know. Um, all right. So that's that. Uh, I Again, I went through and, and saw, I feel like I had, I don't think there's much difference in the way my language is and tools. They kind of came out around the same, I feel like I would have had, had I played with the 5e rules. Um, but let's talk about the instances of things that I did encounter. So, funnily enough, in the first kind of combat encounter of the game, there was an instance where I would have had sneak attack as an opportunity attack. Uh, but I couldn't have it because of the way the new playtest rules are written. But honestly, I wasn't that broken up about it. Granted, it was the first combat of the game, but you know, it was just like a random person on the side of the road attacked the party, and he was very clearly going for one of the characters who had moved away. And me and and the fighter were engaged with the enemy, and he ran after the ranger because that's who he was going after. Uh, so in theory, had I made an opportunity attack and hit. That would have benefited from sneak attack due to my ally being within five feet. Uh, so that was an instance where that would have came up. We'll see how much... I'll keep a mental track of how many times I would have been able to get sneak attack as we move through the campaign to see if the whole sneak attack only working on your turn is a very huge detrimental thing. So we'll see. The other aspects of things that I did get to experience that I enjoyed is the new aspects of the new version of the Lucky Feet, as well as the heroic inspiration from the expert classes. So for those of you who don't know, they changed the way inspiration works. Uh, and I believe previously, I'd have to look at the 5e rules, but I'm pretty sure inspiration was essentially just a reroll of a die. They have reclassified inspiration in the 1 D&D playtest to provide you advantage on a roll, which in my mind is actually better uh, well, it, it's it's a double-edged sword, right? Because if it was a re-roll and you had advantage on a roll, you'd essentially get to roll a third die, uh, pick which one you were going to re-roll. Whereas if it's something that grants you advantage and you have things that trigger off the instances of having advantage, that will benefit you. For example, as me, someone playing a rogue, and I say I don't have anything to hide behind and I don't have any allies nearby, but I have an ability to self-initiate advantage on myself with using something like inspiration, then I can force myself into a situation having sneak attack on an enemy I would not normally have. And I think that that's pretty cool. Now, again, there are other, I'm sure there are other instances that are escaping me that have benefits of, you know, if you have advantage on the attack roll, X, Y, Z happens. But playing as a human, uh, I got to get inspiration whenever I finish a long rest. So I always have that in my back pocket to use. And having read, uh, this is something that I do want to get your guys' opinion on. If we read the way inspiration works, you tell me how you think it is. So it says, you know, the inspiration in the character origin says you have inspiration. You can expend it to give yourself advantage on a D20 test. You must decide to do so before rolling the die. So reading that means if I have inspiration and I go to roll a D20, I have to say, you know what, I'm going to use my inspiration and I'm going to roll 2d20 because it'll have advantage. Now, if you were to go to the expert classes, uh, it's they change that language, and it could be a very significant change. Uh, it says you can expend it to give yourself advantage on a d20 test. You decide to do so immediately after rolling the d20. Now, what does that mean to you? Immediately after rolling the d20. Previously, I think it was pretty clear because it said you must do so before rolling the die. Okay, right? I haven't rolled anything. I want advantage on this roll. I'm going to do it. Pretty self-explanatory. Immediately after rolling the d20, to me, translates to I roll a d20, and then after that I decide, do I want to have advantage on this roll? There's nothing in there about, like, the DM can't tell you if it's a hit or a miss. It seems like it's all self-imposed, but if I roll a d20 and I'm like, oh, crap, I got a natural one, or two, or a three, or whatever... 
I can say I'm going to use my inspiration immediately after I made that roll to then give myself advantage, cancel, potentially, hopefully canceling out the lower of the numbers. That's how I treat it, which if that's the case is awesome, right? I very much appreciate the change in the way inspiration was handled from the first, uh, the character origins to the expert classes, and it still works to give me advantage on the roll, which I think that's something they're also trying to get away from is the sort of sub mechanics within mechanics where there's like funky interactions with things. We'll talk about that when we get to lucky in a little bit here. Uh, but this, instead of it just being a reroll, they've kind of removed the concept of a reroll in place of advantage. I think that works. Uh, also, we got to witness the, the new heroic inspiration mechanic, which is if a character rolls a one on a D20 test, so that's an attack roll ability check or saving throw, they get inspiration. Now, it specifically states, like, if this roll is discarded, it doesn't count. So if you make a roll with advantage and you roll a 5 and a 1, that 1 is discarded, effectively not benefiting from it, so you wouldn't get the, the extra inspiration on it. But if you happen to roll a natural 1 for something else, you get inspiration. And it follows the same rules that have existed that they've built for this, which is you can only have one instance of inspiration at a time. If you have an instance already and would gain one, you can choose to give it to another ally who does not have inspiration, and you lose all uses of it when you finish a long rest. So you're not going to be holding on to this thing forever. It actually benefits you more to use it in case more natural ones and things are rolled. There's a potential to get access to more. And then again, me playing as a human, every time I start a long rest or finish a long rest, I will lose any inspiration I already had, but I will then gain a new one. Um, and also the DM still has the ability to just give out, you know, dole out inspiration as they see fit based on whatever reasons they, they want to do so. So when I mentioned the updates to the heroic inspiration rule, where now it comes on the benefit of rolling a natural one, the party and the DM were actually really excited about this new rule. They liked it a lot. We actually, like I said, got to see it in play. There were a couple of natural ones rolled. It also has funky interaction with halflings, right? Because technically a halfling can roll a natural one and all halflings re-roll natural ones. So you can potentially never benefit from this unless you roll a second natural one. Um, because again, the rolls, the dies that are discarded don't benefit from, don't you know grant the inspiration. So we didn't have any halflings in the party, as I mentioned, but that could be something to consider uh, if that affects your decision one way or another. But the DM was generally excited about it. Uh, she was trying to angle that, you know, sh the DM should get it too. If you want to play like that at your table, you can. But, you know, this is clearly a very player-oriented mechanic. And I just said, hey, listen, they gave you crits back. So take what you can get, right? Uh, but yeah, the, the heroic inspiration, I'm a huge fan of it. It kind of, this may, I'm sure this bothers some people of the concept of like you roll the lowest thing you could possibly roll. And in theory, it should be bad for you. But ultimately, now it's kind of giving you a benefit, and people will talk about how this is making D&D too easy, and there's no consequences to your actions, and blah, blah, blah. Didn't just don't play with the rule, right? That's what I'll say. But uh, I like it. It kind of gives that whole sort of failing forward concept that you kind of see, or like, you know, success, but with a stipulation or snag or something like that that we see in other kind of RPGs that have mechanics similar to that. So I appreciate it. And then the other thing I got to mention again was the Lucky uh, feat, which has been updated in the character origins on Earth Arcana to previously it was three Lucky points, and Lucky was absolutely broken in that it gave you super advantage all the time. So for those of you who don't know, the way the Lucky feat worked in the base player's handbook is when you roll a die, you can roll another die from the luck, use your luck point to roll an additional die, and then pick which die to use. And the way that works is it kind of, it also overwrites advantage and disadvantage. So let's say I have advantage on a roll and I roll a one, a 17, and then I say, you know what, I'm going to use lucky, and then I'm going to roll a 19. And I can pick one, 17, or 19, whichever one I pick, is the role that is effect that, that you know that affects this check or whatever it is the other two roles are discarded here's the thing a lot of people i think don't seem to know if i have disadvantage on the roll and i were to do the same thing a one a 17 and then roll a 19 i don't have to default to the one and i don't get to necessarily i don't have to replace the one the one with a 19 or however 
because of the way Lucky is worded, I have a 1, 17, and 19. I get to pick which one of the three I would like to use, and that becomes the die I use for the outcome of this ability or this check or whatever it may be. So in some instances, I've seen people self-impose disadvantage on themselves and then use a luck point because it increased their odds of succeeding because they were rolling three dice instead of two or one. So yeah, people purposefully poisoning themselves to roll 2d20 2D with disadvantage and then using a luck point to add a third one in because now you have three dice to pick from and the potential to be, you know, something to be really good and allow you to, you know, better, you know, succeed in a, a more extravagant fashion or succeed where you may have just flat out failed. Um, so they have changed lucky now to be proficiency bonus times per long rest. So currently we are level three. So I only have two uses of this. So I'm a little bit less in the use department than a standard character would have been having only three. But ultimately, at higher levels, I can have upwards of six lucky points, which is pretty cool. And basically what happens is uh, it reads, immediately after you roll a d20 for a d20 test, you can, ex you can spend one luck point to give yourself advantage on the roll. So no more super advantage, but it does give you advantage on the roll, meaning you now can benefit, use it to self, like I said, self-trigger sneak attack. It also has similar wording to the updated inspiration rules, which I'll read to you one more time and you tell me what you think. Immediately after you roll a d20 for a d20 test, you can spend one luck point to give yourself advantage on the roll. So again, to me, then realize that I roll and make the roll and then I said, hey, you know what, I'm going to have advantage on it and then I do so and get to roll a second time. But I think I still get to see the outcome of the original die roll before I choose to trigger the advantage. Same thing with the disadvantage option, which is when a creature rolls a d20 for an attack roll against you, you can spend... Actually, no, because that says when a creature rolls a d20 attack against you, you can spend one luck point to impose disadvantage on that roll. The way I kind of read that one is in the process of them rolling, not immediately after you roll a d20. It's when a creature rolls a d20, you can say, hey, you know what, I have disadvantage on that roll. Not like, hey, I rolled a 20, yes, and then you're like, no, I actually have disadvantage, roll again. That's how I'm reading it. Like, you have to choose the disadvantage before the roll is made, whereas the advantage is after, immediately after. So I do feel like I get to see the outcome, or at least the die, and what, what's facing on the die before I get to choose if I want advantage or not. Uh, and again, like I said, this is the instances of uh, kind of updating these to fall more in line with just existing mechanics with the advantage or disadvantage. But I did get to benefit from Lucky as well as Inspiration. And I got to tell you, as a human rogue... Being able to have, you know, that one inspiration to just rely on from out the gate, as well as the two lucky points and give yourself advantage on whether that be ability checks, attack rolls, things of that nature. And I got use out of all of them. I used basically anytime we had a day in where we were doing things in the game, I would pretty much always expend my inspiration and my two luck points to ensure that I could do whatever I needed to do to the best of my ability, knowing full well that I'd get all three of them back on a long rest if I didn't get other inspiration uses throughout the course of the gameplay. So again, we didn't get too, too much done in the course of the game itself because, like I said, a lot of it was backstory. But yeah, I had, uh, I got to roll, um, I, like I said, I had that one instance where I would have had sneak attack, but I didn't have it. I did get to use the new um, Thief Rogues. Well, I guess it's not necessarily new, but I got to use, um, what do they call it, Fast Hands? the ability to make a bonus action um, a sleight of hand check. Oh, and two weapon fighting. That was the other thing. I did decide to wield two scimitars, and because of the updated rules of the playtest that causes the two weapon fighting mechanics to be tied to the light property of the weapon, not a bonus action, I was, every turn, making two attacks with scimitars, still freeing up my bonus action to do other things, which I did really appreciate, uh, and I did that in every combat we got into. I was always fighting with two swords. And like I said, I like that. I think that that's pretty cool. And I am a fan of that. I think that I hope that doesn't change. I'd like to see that continued forward. Um, oh, and the search action, right? The other part of it was the fast hands lets me take the search action as a bonus action. So in combat, I can make perception checks. Like I said, that one's a little bit more niche because some DMs just give people free perception checks in combat when in theory, if you're looking for something, it's supposed to be a whole action uh, I'm going to probably uh, see the tricky part is like, I don't want to stress that. Cause it's like, that's one of my cool abilities that I can do is use this thing as a bonus action. So I want to be able to do it. 
But at the same time, it's just like, well, if the DM's not going to make that the rule for the game, do I want to stress it and then cause other people not to be able to make perception checks? I don't know. And the other side of it is, again, that we had the DM was kind of still getting used to the concept of the playtest rules. And it was basically like, you let me know what the rules are, and then we'll kind of decide if we need to at the moment if things need to be tweaked or adjusted. And honestly, I feel like for the most part, the new updated rules with like the new condition rules and stuff like that, I think a lot of that stuff is uh, in a better spot. And the uh, the ranger playing the playtest ranger did choose the guidance spell as a cantrip and ultimately chose to go with the new version of guidance from the playtest rules where it is a reaction, but you're limited in how often you can do it. And we did get to see him use guidance in response to a failed role. Unfortunately, he didn't roll high enough to trigger that failure into a success, but we got to try it out. And we both all, actually everybody pretty much at the table agreed that we think we like the new guidance because ultimately it does what you're trying to get it to do, right? You want to turn the failure into a success. That's why you use guidance. And then it being a reaction to you failing makes sense. The only thing the jury's still kind of out on is this whole once per long rest effectiveness to it. I don't know what the answer is to on how to you know adjust or fix that personally, but um, I also brought up that again he doesn't have access to bark skin yet, but I let him know, hey, by the way, uh, when you get to a higher level, uh, you know I think it's level five for rangers, bark skin is an up it's been updated to not just be give you sixteen AC, it has changes to it. Perhaps uh, you might want to look into that uh, and possibly end up taking that spell when you normally wouldn't. So. That's pretty much it, folks. Uh, you know, and this is a longer video, but I also wanted to establish what was going on. Hopefully, uh, next game, it looks like we are going to kind of start to get into the concept. Like, we're learning more about the world. We should be really rolling into stuff. I did get to do a lot of rogue-based things, like sneaking around. And uh, I was kind of tasked with by Hermes to steal a necklace from a Delphi temple. So I did that. Um, and I got to pretty much, again, put to full use all of my roguish abilities uh especially again inspiration and double lucky which is awesome uh and i know some people had questions about the comment and comments about the feet choices that i took because i took skilled and i took lucky as for my being a human and for my background uh, but i think i ultimately liked that better i was thinking about maybe skilled twice for six skill proficiencies but and you know obviously there's things like tough and other you know there's the fighting styles as well would have been an interesting option to possibly take um, but I think I decided this is fits the character that I want to build the kind of, uh, again, the Autolycus inspired from the Xena Hercules series character, lucky and skilled kind of fits well, in my opinion. And then also I've, you know, I, I feel like it works well to be able to give that self sneak attack. So anyway, folks, this is kind of my, it's a vlog. So vlogs don't really have a format. You just kind of talk about whatever you want, but, uh, yeah, I think so far I'm very positive. Two thumbs up on the playtest versions of the stuff I'm playing so far. When we get into more serious combats and poss you know, possibly more long combats with multiple enemies, then I may have a better idea of what, uh, of you know, how things kind of shake out in comparison. But anyway, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. I'll see you all next time.